Today our guest is Chris Stark, my dear friend. Um, so Chris, you gave us a very nice playlist. Let's talk about it a little bit. Um, so take it away. Thanks, Daisy. Nice to see you again. Uh, it's been fun getting this uh, little project off the ground in the pandemic because, uh, you know, we're all spending lots of time at home. So it's nice to to talk to people about music. But uh, my playlist that I put together here, I would say represents a little bit of what I've been thinking about with like Racket Society, but also just kind of music in general. And that it's really hard to um, express the kind of like various interests you have through a playlist or through any kind of like concert program or even in like a class lecture or something because there seems to be this idea that the music sort of has to be similar or has to be kind of part of a similar genre or has to flow from one piece to another and i kind of don't listen to music that way and i don't think i ever have and i think just because i came from like a, the middle of nowhere and I didn't really have a sense of like a tradition of something and so I just sort of had to piece together these things so this playlist in a way is just pieced together like that and I I gave it kind of an arbitrary structure which is my like weird nerdy composer background <laughs> but the the compose like the music on this list is all people that I just really admire and really love listening to even if their genres are completely different from one another things from like folk music to experimental electronic music to almost uh, indie kind of electronic dance music or, you know, ambient music, just all stuff I love. And I, I actually made several playlists that were a little more seamless, like kind of one kind of genre or closer to a similar kind of genre, all the tracks. And I just eventually was like, this is, I just want to put together the stuff that I actually have been listening to all year. So represent that even if it maybe doesn't flow sometimes the thing is that actually it does flow i don't know why you say that it doesn't flow maybe it doesn't flow in a kind of more mainstream sort of way that as you said like that they are not all in the same genre but for example so you started with ruth anderson whom i loved really um sort of heard her name before but it turns out i actually didn't listen to any of her music so the first piece points from her is apparently from 1974 um, what it does to the playlist is that because you start with that one, it almost kind of like centers you because it's a track that cannot be ignored, right? It is hypnotic and sort of like catches your attention. And then it almost makes you kind of like open and ready to listen to music. So that's why I think it's a very good starter. But maybe you should tell us a little bit more about Ruth Anderson because there are two tracks from Anderson here. Yeah, so this is from a new release that came out last year, and she sort of sadly passed away recently. Um, she was 90 or 91 years old or something like right. that. And there hasn't been a lot um, released by her. Uh, I think this album might be the first record of her music that's sort of been put out, um, just only including her works. And... Uh, I only discovered it recently, which I have to say is incredibly embarrassing. And the reason I say that is because she lived in my hometown in Montana. So this, I mean, when I found this out, it was like kind of devastating actually when I heard her music and then I read about her and I was like, holy crap, this person was like literally just down the road in this tiny town I lived in, in Montana. You making could have met her. <laughs> exactly. Making experimental electronic music and doing field recordings around the same place that I do field recordings. Um, so there's this quality to her work that for me recently, she's become like this like mystical, spiritual godmother. And I think <laughs> about her a lot. And I think back to a little bit of the interview I did with uh, Mastermind, where he talked about like the magical people in society, these people that kind of do their own thing and are off the beaten path. And for me, she's one of these people, like someone who grew up in Montana in the 19. 30s, 40s, which would have been just like being in the 1850s or something in another country and right. finding this path of being a professional musician and starting an experimental electronic music studio in New York City. I mean, it's it's crazy. Um, so these pieces, I mean, they feel so they're like in my blood when I listen to that music, the way that it moves, like the timing of it and the way that it um, how gentle it is and how spacious it is and how um, 
focused it is. There's something about like where I'm from that this music represents. And uh, when I listen to it, it just immediately puts me back into that space of a place where like time moves very slowly. I mean, hmm. not a lot goes on in like the rural mountain West. And if you're, you know, I spent the first 24 or 25 years of my life there and it's a very slow existence. And that's why I like really slow music and music that is just kind of is the way it is. And I'm going on and on here, but you know, there's other composers who wrote experimental music like this, you know, many like Stockhausen and Berio and much bigger names. And, you know, I like to think of the way that she composes this music kind of in contrast to the way that they might compose it, which if it was Stockhausen or Berio, it might be much more kind of fragmented or, um, yeah. you know, noty or aggressive even. And in this context, it's just very, um, I keep coming back to the word gentle, but it does focus you and it is very meditative. And I, I love that quality about the first piece and the last piece, same thing. It just it puts me into a headspace where I feel like I am calm which I think is a noble thing to do as a, as a musician to try to calm people down. <laughs> Absolutely. And interestingly enough, again, since we are sort of like talking about the structure of your playlist, starting with Anderson, ending with Anderson, and in the middle, there's Harold Budd, which sort of like does a similar sort of thing, but with different tools and this time from the 80s, etc. Um, he, of course, like immediately reminded me of uh, Brian Eno, and I didn't know of their connection, but there's, of course, apparently a connection when I read about it, I found out. And for me, this kind of like Eno, Vangelis, and we arrive at Niels from kind of lineage is, of course, something that I love very much. So what about Harold Budd? How come he came into the list? So, I mean, this is also kind of sad now that I think about it. He also recently passed away um, oh, yeah. and I have always loved his music. Uh, his album, The Pearl, that he made with Brian Eno is yeah. probably in my Desert Island like record list because it's just so beautiful. But um, I wanted to put something in there that represented my love of like ambient electronic music, especially from the 70s and 80s. Uh, that's yeah. a huge influence. Brian Eno is a huge influence on me and Harold Budd now as well. And uh, it's a very simple little track, you know, there's nothing grandiose about it. I, I just wanted to kind of put like a little uh, bit of his music in there. Uh, he has some much longer pieces that I really love uh, from like, he put out a record in the 70s. Um, I'm trying to see the name, I wrote it down, uh, The Pavilion of Dreams. Yeah. And the, there's some tracks on there that are much longer, like in the 10 to 20 minute range. And they're some of my favorite ambient pieces because they have some acoustic instruments in them and other things. Uh, and so I just wanted to have something in there representative of Harold Budd that would hopefully lead people to listen to, to more of his work. Um, yeah, I think it is really great. I can't quite tell like, you know, which one comes first for me, but of course it is such a quintessential kind of 80s sound as well. And obviously I was a kid in the 80s. So this was sort of the sound of whatever TV and music, et cetera, that was around me. So, I mean, it, there's also a kind of very emotional kind of connection that it immediately taps into that for me. So I'm just like, oh, give me more of that. <laughs> so I, I loved it. And then it sort of, yeah, did kind of work as a recentering piece after which you were sort of like ready to listen to more music that was busier and, you know, doing more things such as with the CNDSD uh, tracks that you have two of. So she is apparently a Mexican musician. So how did you come across her music? I didn't know her before, but I like it quite a bit. Yeah, I found this EP uh, in tongues that she put out uh, last year or 2019, I can't remember. And I think I found it on like a, a band camp, like, uh, you know, playlist or something and immediately fell in love with it. And the more I dug into her background and like how she makes this music, it just, you know, completely fascinates me because she's a, a live coder. So some of this yeah. music that you're hearing is actually improvised on the computer. Uh, some of it is algorithmically set up and then sort of plays out over the course of however many minutes. And I think uh, some of her music, she just improvises and then kind of clips out sections of it that she thinks could be mm. put on a record. and. This idea of you know a 21st century kind of jazz in which people are improvising through computer code is mind blowing. And interestingly enough, I just hosted her online at WashU where I teach for a lecture uh, this past Friday. 
And <laughs> it was amazing, like great turnout. The students absolutely loved it. I mean, people were totally fascinated because she just, you know, can pull open a, a text editing program and start writing code and make incredibly interesting, you know, experimental or dance music. And uh, yeah, her name is uh, Malitsin Cortez. And um, I had never heard of her before this record, but uh, super excited by everything that she's putting out. And I love the intensity of the the drum machine vibe of it. And it's really driven, as far as I can tell, you know, at least on this record, a lot by drum samples, which I love the simplicity of that and just the complexity yeah. of the the rhythms and the polyrhythms and the changing tempos. And then usually like there's one other little sample in there that kind of gives it some kind of depth. Um, but there's not like, you know, some driving bass line or like some kind of like melodic motive or something. No. It's just, it's a sample that gets manipulated oftentimes in a kind of microtonal way. And then just like hard driving, like classic drum machine sounds. Yeah. So what, what sort of like background is she from? How does one become a live programmer? She's a, she said in her talk that she was in a punk band, uh, which mm. gives a sense of her kind of some of her aesthetics, which are kind of punk rock, online punk rock. And then also she studied architecture. And so I think she spent a lot of time knowing my other architecture friends, probably doing a lot of computer programming for like virtual design, um, which is a fairly common thing. And uh, a lot of people use a program called processing, which designs visuals. And my guess is that, you know, using that coding language from visuals in processing translated to the things that she uses like Super Collider and Tidal Cycles, which are other software for, for making electronic music. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, I don't know if you actually ever noticed that with Spotify. You know how Spotify can actually tell you where a certain artist or a track has been listened to most in the world? They have that yeah. kind of like data that I always check that. And um, Mexico City is one of the places that seems like an amazing place in terms of the sort of like music they listen to and the variety of music they listen to like the most out there kind of like music that you listen and you see like number one, Mexico City. So, I mean, in a way, she coming from there doesn't actually surprise me because of that. I feel like going there and being a little bit part of the music scene there would be amazing, actually. Yeah, I've never been. I would love Nor to go. I. It's very high on my list because it's, you know, same time zone. It's not even that far away. And I just can't believe that I've never been there. But I've heard incredible things and yeah. Judging by yeah. her work, so, I'm sure there's a cool scene. So totally, yeah. And then, of course, it is followed by your Norwegian music love. <laughs> <laughs> the Hardinger uh, violin comes in here with two of the Benedict Marset uh, uh, tunes. That's really interesting as well. Can you actually tell us a little bit about that uh, particular fiddle? Why does it sound like a viola? <laughs> <laughs> Or is it a viola? <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know that much about that instrument. I've read a little bit about it. And actually, she has an amazing book that she put out last year called To Be Nothing, which is kind of a history of um, the Hardinger Fjord, where she's from, and some of the, the musicians um, that have played that instrument and kept that music alive. Highly recommend. Uh, but I know it has sympathetic resonating strings which mm. that are like underneath the fingerboard, which is of course something that the violin and viola don't have. Right. Uh, it has lots of different tunings as well, which is something that typically you don't see a lot of in, you know, violin, viola music. Um, I'm not sure what the materials are for the strings and the bow and things like that. So it's possible that that would, you know, change the sound of it quite a bit from a, yeah. um, what we hear as like modern violin or fiddle music in the United States. But it has also to do with the way that she plays the instrument, which is very unique. Mm -hmm. Part of that tradition is learning how to play the traditional tunes in a way that is representative of you. So people talk about, I could be totally wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that people talk about the tunes as being played by this person. So it's like, I learned this tune as this person showed us how to, how to do it in their own style. Oh. And so she has this incredibly beautiful style with like a very like soft bow pressure and so there's a lot of kind of airy wispy sounds and yeah. things like that and it maybe sounds very close mic'd and but also i can imagine her in some you know amazing kind of like norwegian church somewhere and, right, and right. recording these re recording these albums but the sound quality of her playing is just like completely captivating it immediately 
sucks me in like the second I hear the first note, I'm like, Oh yeah, I have to listen to this. This is like someone who really cares about tone color and um, how to produce it. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's no surprise that it brings us back to our ECM subject again, because she did actually also release through ECM, right? Not everything, but some of some of the stuff that she did is through ECM. I mean, one of the things that I kind of like immediately pick up, of course, that yeah, it does sound like ECM could put out something like that. You know, this is I think how we all got sort of introduced to uh, all the Scandinavian instruments and music from that period, actually through eighties. 90s is ECM uh, records so but she seems like a younger person isn't she yeah she's probably around our age if I had to guess yeah, and she right. I actually met her in Bergen um 2019 uh because we had we had done an artist residency at the same place um not at the same time and so the person who runs that residency put us in touch and uh we had lunch and chatted about you know fiddle tunings and <laughs> she's just a really lovely person and just incredibly thoughtful and I'm I'm just a huge fan and I think those tracks are just like stunningly beautiful and the they are very beautiful yeah the the uh inflection and the the melodic stuff just like kills me and it also any kind of this traditional music that has this this emphasis on ornamentation and inflection I don't know it feels in some ways, like it can translate to other cultures uh, very easily. Uh, I mean, it makes me think of learning how to play like blues on the guitar and other kinds of stuff like this and how important it is those little kind of pitch bends or, you know, uh, uh, ornamentations that really make the music what it is. And I think that she's obviously a master of that. That they are basically the yeah, main tool for expressivity, actually. Yeah, that's right. And then that brings us to Chris Thompson that uh, both of the tracks I actually loved very much. Um, they are both sort of like quite danceable actually. And Chris Thompson is going to be our guest, right? So I can't yeah, wait hopefully. to talk to him. <laughs> actually. Yeah, we've reached out and he's interested. So hopefully we'll have him on here soon. Um, yeah. So is, there is uh, a lot of like sound collage kind of stuff going on here as well, right? But in a sort of like more linear and more danceable sort of way than uh, CNDSD. Um, so that's a little bit different. So how, how did you come across his music? You know him, right? Is that why? Yeah, I met Chris through, uh, he plays in a large chamber orchestra called Alarm Will Sound. And oh, of course they I know the have a residency yeah. in St. Louis, so they play here a lot. And that's how I came to know him. Uh, he does a lot of arranging for that group. And he is a ridiculously good arranger. I mean, the arrangements he makes, um, I actually had the chance to work with him on one of them and just seeing how amazing the the percussion stuff was and he does a lot of stuff where he'll have all the members of the ensemble play percussion instruments but incredibly imaginative and just virtuosic really i mean he's a super smart person and an incredible musician and i'm so glad that he's making music like as an independent artist or as a solo artist now and just kind of bringing in his friends to you know record you know double bass or piano or voice or whatever into this music that he's producing because it's super interesting. I mean, obviously, the rhythmically, it's just super fun and, and super engaging. And there's uh, arrangement wise, all the different percussion instruments, particularly the marching band percussion instruments, which yes. I don't hear a lot of like Kevlar drum heads and the, the quads they use and other kinds of instruments in in music. I mean, I hear a lot of obviously like Latin percussion, like timbales and other kinds of things, but which is my ear would relate it to that maybe if I didn't know this stuff. but. Uh, that part of it is super cool. And, you know, people who are percussionists who come from, you know, maybe a drum core kind of background where they play a lot of like rudiments on snare drums and things, they have just crazy uh, skill with, with rhythm and articulation. And I mean, it's virtuosic. And so bringing some of that virtuosity of rhythmic writing and playing into the, this kind of like indie electronic music, super fresh to my ear, super interesting. And, uh, yeah, I just love listening to it's it. It's very tightly edited that even though it has all these kind of like seemingly kind of like super different collage bits, it, they come together in a kind of quite homogeneous sort of way that it does make it kind of like very danceable, especially the second one, She Creeps. I listened to it so many millions of times this week. <laughs> I must have really brought the number of listens in Spotify <laughs> quite high because it is really lovely. It just like opens a little bit slower and then picks up as it goes. And then it has sort of like a B part 
where a little bit of olale kind of singing comes in <laughs> and then that drops and then it sort of like goes back to the other part again it's just like what's going on here and it's really lovely i i love it and i think more people should know it i was really surprised that, that only like thousand listens happened on, on on spotify at least i mean it may have been available elsewhere of course but um yeah and i don't know to be better known if he has more plans to do stuff with vocalists because it obviously he's you know adept songwriter so it would be really very cool to to hear some more things with with vocals and uh this vocalist is a, a kind of person in the new music scene in new york um so oh, yeah. it's really cool again to sort of like bring someone in a friend of his probably and just have them record these vocals which you know the lyrics are are pretty wild and kind of fun and the hook like the the kind of chorus hook of this is really great uh, and also, I mean, he just always writes these very interesting harmonic transitions and, and, and chord progressions that you don't see coming. And, you know, you don't want to get into a territory where something feels like it's like just, you know, interesting for the sake of being interesting, like, you know, prog rock or something. But but he it always feels very like tied to some kind of emotional like elevation or something that kind of draws you more into the music. Like it's it's very uh, cleverly done. And he does that in the, the first track there, too. Um, lot hero there's just some chord progressions on there and the way that he kind of arranges them and voices them out that you know do remind me a little bit of like you know Niels Fromm and these people that we like but it's yeah yeah uh it just you know what was actually engaging you more and more uh, there's something in, in in she creeps that I I first didn't realize what it was but then finally when I kind of like became really obsessive with it and then I realized that there's a kind of like bass line kind of like a ostinato bass line that keeps turning around it's played on a kind of like almost sounds like an analog synthesizer because it's also again out of tune remember how you were pointing out that in my playlist i sort of like had a liking for kind of like out of tune synths and here too he has it and each time I, it comes i'm just like yes it came again i love <laughs> this out of tune synth so much I, I don't know what it is about out of tune synths you know it maybe makes it a little bit more like a real instrument perhaps by yeah. showing you that it's not quite right, you know? Sure. I mean, if you want to make a really rich synth sound, you have to layer, um, you know, different waveforms that are sometimes slightly out of tune with one another to get it to have a, a richness or a complexity. Um, I love the sound too. I mean, it's, it's Yeah, fantastic. yeah, totally, yeah, addictive. And, and makes you kind of like, you want to hear it again and again as I did, yeah. Yeah, this is great. Um, Thank you so much for this lovely playlist. I'm biased, of course. You're my friend. I I, I I would probably like what comes from it, but this playlist has such good taste. I have to say. <laughs> it's very uh, easy to you. like it. And it's also a kind of like nice, nice kind of like bite size. It's 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 not huge, so it is kind of like easy to actually sit down and listen to it, but properly listen to it, because I think it, it sort of requires attention as well, rather than sure. just you know letting it be a background playlist sort of thing so i think yeah a kind of quieter sort of evening is probably best for it <laughs> for sure and that the especially the, the last track kind of sneaks up on you i mean it's very long and you know most people probably won't have the patience to to let it play but you can also kind of just throw it on in the background and it has this way of sort of again making me feel very calm over the course of the 20 25 minutes by the end of it i feel like i'm in a different headspace and even though I haven't been paying that close attention to it. But if you do want to pay that close attention to it and hear all these like interesting ways of the, the changing vowels and, you know, the way that these quiet words are whispered, you can hear all this interesting, you know, dynamic change in the sound. But, but for the most part, it has this kind of calming kind of like listening to the, the wind and trees or something, which again, brings me back to that Montana sense of, it sounds like wind in pine trees. That's what that, whispered yeah. sound sounds like so and that's why i suppose it also is very timeless that had i not known like that it was written when it was written yeah the last one is from 79 the first one is from 74 i mean it's such a long time ago actually but it, it sounds like it could have been written yesterday uh, there's yeah the, the, the timelessness to her music i really love that so thanks for introducing me to ruth anderson that was really great yeah of course thanks Daisy. Appreciate thanks it. chris <laughs>